Hello, I'm alive. I survived the cursed petrified wood. So far. Someone mentioned that petrified wood can contain uranium. And you're right, especially the 80 pounds of it I grabbed near Petrified Forest National Park, which was mined for uranium during World War II. Did I know this fact before taking the wood? I did not. Was I mildly concerned about radiation after the fact? Yes, so I moved my wood outside. But realistically, the risk of developing any chronic health effects due to being in contact with this wood is incredibly, incredibly low. You're way, way more likely to get silicosis from mining or grinding it. But I'm still keeping it outside because, just in case, you know. Hello, if you haven't met me yet, I'm Geology Joes, your friendly neighborhood geologist that makes questionable life decisions. As promised, I am taking you on a geology adventure through New Mexico, with a bonus side quest. So if that sounds fun to you, stick around and subscribe for more geology adventures. This past week, I crossed something off of my bucket list that I've been dreaming about for years. The Albuquerque International Balloon Fiesta, where hundreds of hot air balloons are released into the sky. I don't know what I expected, but I certainly did not expect to get trapped within a wall of hot air balloons with no means to escape other than waiting for them to lift off. There was also something else I did not expect, and I was not happy about it. Hello, it is about three o'clock in the morning in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I am headed to the Balloon Fiesta. I had no idea how like crazy it would be um, with parking, so I bought a bus ticket for 4 a.m. So I'm trying to get to the bus stop. I'm actually not super, super tired, so that's good, but I know I'm going to start to feel it probably <laughs> in the next few hours, if not this upcoming hour. I tried to sleep last night, but it was so, it was so difficult. I tried to get to bed at 8 p.m. so I could get like seven hours of sleep, but I didn't fall asleep until like maybe 11 and I was just like tossing the whole entire night because I was so worried about missing the balloon fiesta. And I'm super excited. <laughs> If you want to save the soul-crushing possibility of not being able to get into the festival, I would advise taking the bus on weekends. Now you might be thinking that it's not so busy at 4am, but you'd be wrong. There were so many people and so many buses and it only got more crowded when I arrived at the actual festival. Already at 5am it was bustling with blanket-wrapped zombies hobbling to the nearest breakfast burrito and Dunkin' Donuts stand. It was inconceivable to a night owl like myself the amount of people up at this ungodly hour. It was not long before I found my people swaddled in blankets in the grassy field napping until something exciting happened. And it didn't take long. They have many morning activities, including a phenomenal drone show. but the real showstopper were obviously the balloons. After about two hours, all of the balloons lifted, and it was time for me to go back to camp and crash. There are events after the mass ascension, but sleep seemed like the more alluring activity at the time, and I wanted to be well-rested for their night session. Their evening activities include skydivers shooting off fireworks from the air, which seems like it's adding unnecessary danger to an already dangerous activity, but who am I to say? A balloon glow, another drone show, and so many fireworks from all directions.
To finish off the night, they have live music until close. If you stay long enough, you may even get free donuts from one of the many donut stands as they close down for the night. I saw people walking out with multiple dozens of donuts. Guess who just got free donuts? Me! <laughs> nice. It was such a wonderful experience, and it got me thinking about how unique the human experience is. We have a whole festival dedicated to one of the weirdest forms of transportation. I wondered if we have always been this way, looking for reasons to celebrate and join in community. And for the rest of my trip, I chased the answer to this question. Ah, ah. <laughs> okay, I really should go to bed now. See ya. Good morning. <laughs> I just woke up. Um, and it looks like I still have the campground to myself. Nobody came in last night. hoping to have my free donuts this morning but come to find out I'm actually allergic to them so I have eggs and chicken and tomato that I'm gonna scramble up hopefully it doesn't take too long to make yesterday it took so long to make eggs so my plan for the day was to check out the two prehistoric Native American civilizations just south of Los Alamos, also known as the location of the secret laboratory where the first atomic weapons were designed and built in the 1940s. The first site is called Sankawi Prehistoric Sites. A 1.5-mile loop trail will take you through what was once home to the Puebloans. It is believed they first occupied the area around 1400 AD and stayed until the late 1500s when severe drought occurred. You will see what seems to be footprints and footpaths carved into the rock. This is the path the Puebloans traveled to get to their homes and farms for decades. You can quite literally walk in their footsteps and even step into their old dwellings. The black staining on the ceiling is soot. It indicates the use of fire for light and heat. <laughs> the trail used to go through the main village, which consisted of a structure with about 350 rooms and was two to three stories high and had an enclosed central courtyard. But now the trail has been redirected away from the village due to recent vandalism and theft of cultural artifacts. This is why we can't have nice things. I could not find much information on this specific site, but the next location made up for it. Within Bandelier National Monument, less than 30 minutes down Route 4 from the first site, sits the most dramatic and impressive Native American village nestled into the cliffs of the Frijoles Canyon, and it has a lot to do with the geology. 1.1 million and 1.4 million years ago, ash rained down over this 1,500 square mile sliver of New Mexico, covering the landscape with a thousand foot thick ash flows in places. As the hot ash cooled, it became a rock known as tuff, which is not as tough as it sounds, making it easy for water to erode and create little caves and canyon faces. The early inhabitants used the soft rock to their advantage, carving shelters into the cliff sides called cavates. They also used tough blocks to build apartment-like structures in front of the cavates. The cavates were predominantly located in the south or southeast facing cliffs which allowed sunlight to warm the dwellings in the winter and the thick stone kept them cool in the summer. You can see a reconstruction of these houses along the 1.4-mile Pueblo Loop Trail, which takes you through the ruins of this once bustling city that was home to hundreds of Puebloans during its heyday. 
The first structure you see is known as a kiva, which was a center for religious and political life. It would have had an earthen roof, which has since collapsed. The next structure is known as Tioni Pueblo, which consists of over 400 rooms and would have been the center of daily life. There were no windows and doors were located in the roof, presumably to maintain the structural integrity of walls or to keep rodents and cold weather out. About a hundred people would have lived here, along with an additional four hundred or more in the cliff dwellings above. Five hundred years ago, you would probably see women grinding corn and making pottery, men chopping wood with axes made from volcanic basalt, and children herding domesticated turkeys with the family dog. Despite a dry climate with little rain, the Puebloans were able to sustain life here for 400 years from 1150 to 1550 CE using the geology to their advantage and several innovative farming techniques including grid gardens. These gardens were constructed by digging depressions to collect water and the surrounding them with low rock walls which released heat at night. Volcanic soils, like those found in Frijoles Canyon, contain many minerals that are easily accessible to plants and have good water retention, making them fertile. The pumice in the soil acts like a sponge, absorbing water and releasing it slowly over time. Corn, bean, and squash were also planted together because they each offer the soil needed nutrients to sustain the triad. Food was dried and stored in large clay pots for use during the winter months. Another reason this canyon may have been so good at supporting life is that it is known as an ecotone. An ecotone is a transition zone that has a high biological diversity, offering plenty of medicinal herbs and food to hunt and gather. Hunting was done using a particular volcanic rock known as obsidian, which is sharp like glass. Because it is glass. Obsidian is lava that cools so quickly crystals are not able to form. Although this village seems isolated today, it was just one out of many villages around the greater Pajarito Plateau, connected by active foot trails. There is evidence that ancestral Pueblo people walked between villages to trade goods, participate in ceremonial activities, and to reach areas for hunting, gathering, and farming. During the mid-1500s, most of the Puebloans relocated along the Rio Grande. The Pueblo people left Frijoles Canyon for a number of reasons, mainly due to overpopulation, resource depletion, and severe drought, leaving behind this impressive historic relic unlike anything I have ever seen. Okay, I've never heard of this recreation area before, but oh my god, it was freaking amazing. Okay, I said that I did not like New Mexico, um, it was my least favorite state, but you know what? New Mexico is growing on me. You just have to travel to the correct part of New Mexico. Western New Mexico? Hell yes. Man, it's so beautiful here. So, so pretty. It's so green and mountainous. After a day full of archaeology, I settled in for the night at one of the many BLM campgrounds in the Hemes National Forest. Hello, I am camping in New Mexico in the higher elevations in a Hemis mountain area and it is so quiet and by quiet I mean silent. There is no noise whatsoever. I don't hear any rustling of leaves. There's no insects chirping, there's no animals, there's no people. It's just eerily silent. And I've never I've never had that before where you can't where you don't hear anything. It's just 
quiet, so quiet that your ears are ringing. It's so weird and creepy. I've been playing music because I don't like how silent it is. I'm not used to total, complete silence and I don't think I like it. <laughs> I really, I really, really had to pee earlier and I was like, I don't want to go out there and pee. It's also really cold. I have multiple layers on right now and multiple blankets so hopefully that's enough i feel super cozy right now but it's just gonna keep dropping in temperature as the night goes on we'll see well that's all i have for this video check out part two of my new mexico adventure for hidden hot springs unusual formations and more ancestral native american sites if you haven't already, please like this video and subscribe to my channel. I really appreciate all of the comments and support. See you next week for more Geology in the Face.